Welcome back to the hopefully final installment of Violent Video Games Are Bad Because They Will Make You A Violent Shooter Trilogy which I should have had a shorter name for it. I've told people that I'm tired of talking about this, but since everyone is talking about it, especially when the executives at the White House were talking about it, looks like this trilogy is gonna go all the way into a perfect synchronized escalation. It all started from a professor of Department of Communication, the Miami Police Department, and finally the White House themselves. I hope the fourth installment will be me arguing about video game violence against the masters of the universe or something. And like any other trilogies, the third one tends to be the worst of the three. But before we move on and embarrass myself with this garbage quality of the video, I want to say huge thanks to Pete for the donation and Delilah, Gritty Gaming, and Rhina for the pledges on Patreon. You guys are fantastic. So let's first talk about a video from White House that got unlisted because, oh boy, that reception is not looking very good for you, Mr. President. Actually, I don't exactly know why it's unlisted, but the ratings are certainly not helping your case. The video is just a compilation of violent scenes in video games, which of course includes the controversial no Russian scene from Modern Warfare 2. But then they also include a glitched out gameplay footage from Fallout 4. You know, White House, if you put a bunch of violent scene compilations in video games, maybe you shouldn't show something that will totally break your immersion. Out of interest, Mr. President, can you please consider this data where violent youth crime is reduced in correlation with the rising number of video game sales? Also, Mr. President, showing these sorts of violent content is one of the best ways for you to get demonetized on YouTube, which everyone in the comments rightfully pointed out. There are some familiar people and some really nasty roasts down there as well. I won't spoil the surprise, so go check it out yourself. I really want to know what kind of point they're trying to make by making this video with zero commentary. Video games are violent. Yes. So what? That still doesn't dispute the fact that violent crime has gone down, and video games sold probably 10 times more than they were back in the 90s. It reminds me so much of the people who go, Oh my god, Japan glorifies lolis and jailbait so much that anime is filled with them all the time. But then when I point out that Japan has very low numbers of rape per capita, they then say, That still doesn't make the content any less disturbing. So the best argument that the White House could bring up into the table with this violent video game montage is that it looks disturbing. And yes, they are. Some even deliberate so if you put it into context. What is your point, White House? Well, apparently the point is that video games are shaping young people's thoughts. No, Mr. President, the fake news media are shaping people's thoughts. The social justice courses in academia are shaping people's thoughts. Me talking to you directly with a cartoon avatar with a head that is too big for his own body and a style very reminiscent of Big Brother from 1984 is shaping people's thoughts or at least I think I do. Video games do not shape the political opinions that people have. Just because I love Batman Arkham City doesn't mean that I always agree with Batman's principles and ideologies. Just because I love Papers, Please doesn't mean that I agree with communists. Just because I played Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel doesn't mean that I agree with discriminating against rich entitled douchebags who look down at the plebs just because they have more money and social status, okay maybe that one, but it's not because the game told me. It's because rich entitled douchebags exist in real life, and I absolutely hate them. Another argument that White House brought up into the table is that the discussion is centered whether video games, including games that graphically simulate killing, desensitize our community to violence. I have to answer that with a yes, it desensitizes people to video game violence. Violence. It does not desensitize people to violence in real life. While I will not hesitate to stab someone in the neck in video games, I don't want to do that in real life because unlike in video games, I will go into prison, I will be marked as a murderer, I will stay behind bars for around 10 years or more, and most importantly, I am neither a sociopath nor a psychopath. While the levels of my empathy are very low, it's not to the point where I will stab people or attempt to kill them just because I don't like them. I think you should look at children who are abused as a child, which is a trait that pretty much a lot of psychopaths, sociopaths, and school shooters in general share. Are they really caused by video games or are they caused by their horrible parenting? I have good parents and I play violent video games alongside my 14 year old brother. We haven't attempted to stab anyone. Now it's not just a bad childhood that can lead people into having low levels of empathy or desensitization to violence. A lot of these can also be influenced by ideologies. There was a horrible and all around stupid event in my hometown Bali where a bunch of stabbings occur between two gangs with radically different ideologies. There were people using machetes and carving the insides of each other's stomachs to the point where people's guts are clearly visible in some of the photos. I've seen not only the pictures of the dead bodies, but also the dead bodies themselves. The image of a real life person's gut spilling out of their stomach and people twitching on the streets struggling to stay alive as they constantly puke blood out of their nose and mouth, those are images that cannot get out of my head. All of that time I've spent playing violent video games and watching violent movies and yet I squick at the sight of blood in real life. The reason is simply because it's real. People actually died. Not actors, not 3D rendered characters in a video game, people in real life. 
who have families, issues, and feelings. I do not have the same level of empathy towards fictional characters. If a fictional character is dead, so what? I do have empathy towards real people dying, including those who died in the recent shootings. But taking your anger and frustration towards things that do not contribute into their death is really not helping this matter, Mr. President. But let's move on to the sorts of people that are invited to the White House. The people who are invited here are actually pretty interesting. One of the organizations that are representing the game industry is the ESA. The ESRB is also attending the meeting. The problem with these two organizations that attend the meeting is that while they are representing the gamers' side of the debate, they don't come in there because they really care about video games or gamers themselves. They are representing the video game industry, because if Trump makes a bill to ban violent video games, then they're going to lose tons and tons of money. Why do I think this way? Well, because of their treatment towards microtransactions and loot boxes that are absolutely anti-consumer in every sense of the word. I have made videos about loot boxes and microtransactions in the past, but I haven't reported on this particular event. Everyone has given their two cents on this and I think they did great jobs at reporting it, but I'm gonna give you a refresher for the sake of this video. So the ESA has a representative to meet up with Chris Lee, a Hawaiian legislator who wants to talk about loot boxes and microtransactions. ESA failed spectacularly in defending this business practice. You can check it out in the video I linked down below. The SRB on the other hand, well, just look at how they deal with microtransactions. They deal with microtransactions by labeling them as in-game purchases, which can also cover DLCs, not just microtransactions or loot boxes. In other words, their solution to warn people about loot boxes and microtransactions is absolutely garbage because they don't want to scare the audiences away with games that will exploit your money. They instead want to trick you into thinking that a game is just fine. In-game purchases only mean DLC, guys. Don't worry, no signs of microtransactions transactions or loot boxes here. If video games do not cause violence, they certainly cause people to become greedy. There was also a conference held in GDC talking about how the government regulating loot boxes are an attempt in censorship. That's right, game developers or publishers exploiting your money by predatory microtransactions is the same thing as game developers showing fan services and tits. If you're a real gamer, a true advocate of free speech, and you defend the rights of game developers to show fan services and tits, you should also defend the rights of game developers to have loot boxes that will milk the consumers for money. But I'm getting a bit off track here. The point is, neither ESRB nor ESA are representing the interests of gamers. They are representing the interests of the game industry. There are also other people who attended the meeting, like the chief executive of Rockstar, the chief executive of ZeniMax Media, a mother from the Parents Television Council, and Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. This is a very interesting individual to pick, because years ago, I did a one-hour video talking about video game violence with my brother, debunking this mess of an article. Yes, you read the title correctly. Are video games breeding an assassination generation? Ah yes, let's blame the lunacy of mass shooters into the video games that people play. And the thing is, this person recognized the argument of mental illness, poverty, drugs, and gangs for the cause of violence and crime in the society, but instead of attempting to fix those, he went on to cite the American Academy of Pediatrics when they say that video games, movies, and other violent entertainment are the easily remediable factor. In other words, video games are just easier to deal with. This is quite a fallacious argument because video games are not the primary cause of people committing mass shootings. They contribute as much as oxygen. Just because something can potentially contribute to something else doesn't mean that you should remove them. Lots of people play violent video games. Lots of people inhale oxygen. None of these people turn into school shooters. What makes these school shooters special than most people? You know, things like mental illness, bad parenting, bad childhood, drugs. But let's not focus on those. Let's focus in the video games because they're just much easier to deal with. And that's not even the most insane statement coming out of his mouth. In another article, he said on his lecture that when you see ISIS beheading people, that means that you also want to do that. Ah yes, ever since I saw those disturbing ISIS videos where they actually cut people's heads off, I also want to do it with another coworker whose political opinions I disagree with. Even if that's true, what's wrong with people doing it in an environment where it's perfectly safe to kill people? Or more accurately, 3D models programmed with their own sets of AIs and behavior traits to behave like human beings. These AIs are no different to shooting targets. Oh no, this shooting target can move and has a head. Please stop shooting your arrows at them. Ban the freaking archery olympics. If you thought that was insane, get a load of this. At one point, he writes that experts who deny the link between video games and adolescent violence will someday be viewed as the moral equivalent of holocaust deniers. 
What in the name of God did I just read? Mr. President, out of interest, can you please invite people from the anti-game side that has some grass in reality? How can you compare people that can prove that there's no link between video game violence and real life violence to the people who denied the genocide of millions? We have evidence to prove that you are wrong. It's just you who chose not to believe it because you're a bigot who is certain that your worldview is the most perfect one and refuses to be confronted by any other evidence. You know, like a real holocaust denier. Projection much, Mr. Grossman? Actually, inviting people who are anti-game and have some grasp on reality is pretty difficult because the most sensible people that I've met, those who don't play video games at all, the best argument that they can give is that these video games are just not for them. And that is perfectly fine. You leave my hobby alone, I will leave yours. But it's clear that a lot of these people on the media, the big government, and the huge corporations are doing all of these out of their own malicious interests. Even the people that are on the pro-gamer side, like the ESRB, and the ESA are not doing it for the sake of the consumers. They're doing it to protect the industry that will give them tons and tons of money by exploiting the consumers as much as possible. So we're living in a world where you cannot trust individuals or organizations, especially when they claim to speak to your interests. So we've gone back to the depressing state after the last very fun discussion about video game violence. Hopefully the next video can be a lot more fun than this. Now with all of that long spiel being said towards the participants and towards Trump himself, I want to once again bring your attention to the absolutely hypocritical mainstream gaming outlets that really don't help with this situation at all. I can even say that it's thanks to these mainstream gaming outlets that post tons and tons of articles about how video games are violent or have some link to violence, they are contributing more and more into Trump putting this decision. Sure, Trump aired his opinions on video games as far as 2012, but you guys are airing your opinions year after year. You claim to be a part of the resistance to fight the power, but in reality you're actually agreeing with the power. You should have told Trump that he was wrong about violent video games back in 2012 and the years onward, but you don't. You agreed with him until he was president. And that's where you maintain the facade. But not good enough to make people to just side with you all the sun. But there's another point of view that I want to share with you. Pace Magazine recently posted an article that talks about how Trump is wrong. There's a caveat though, and that caveat is Trump is wrong, but video games are pretty freaking violent to an unnecessary degree. And if video games are excessively violent for no reason, then politicians like Trump are gonna use it as an argument to say, hey, video games are violent. Well paced, you are right. He did use video games to make the point that video games are violent, and having ultra-violent content will make Trump and many other politicians to say, hey, these games are too violent. But that doesn't refute the fact that video game sales are rising while violent crime and new violence have gone down since 10 years ago. And yes, I agree, they can use these ultra-violent scenes in video games to justify their agenda. In fact, they have. But all of that discussion is irrelevant. We're not discussing about how video games are unnecessarily ultra-violent, we're discussing about how violent video games are linked to real-life violence. While Pace is somewhat agreeing with the gamers, there are also other perspectives as well. Here's an article written by Nathan Grayson on Rock Paper Shotgun in 2012, as in the same year when Trump aired his opinions. He started off bashing the NRA for saying that video games cause violence. Hey, if you're gonna bash the NRA, at least bash them for something that they actually say. And they did say that video games cause violence. Not just video games, in fact, movies as well. After bashing the NRA, he then said this. Can we just drop the fever pitch finger pointing and be honest with ourselves for a second? Forget the nutty politicians, forget the studies that we have been tailored to say whatever people want them to say. Just breathe, count to 10, and look inward. We take tremendous joy in virtual violence. We squeal with glee when life-giving liquid squirts out of men's necks. Does that cause violence? Probably not. I don't have any concrete reasons to believe so anyway. But it gives violence an active, constant role in our day-to-day -day lives. We can't just ignore that. We shouldn't ignore that. It'd be outright irresponsible to do so. Congratulations, 2012 Nathan Grayson. You have found the concept of fiction, where people are totally okay about stabbing, raping, murdering, and killing people. Do you know why we ignored all of that? Because it's fiction, and it's fine to kill people in fiction. It's fine to stab programmed 3D models that appear to be human and can squirt tons and tons of blood. The same way it's fine to shoot a watermelon with an arrow. The same way it's fine to punch a punching bag. The same way it's fine to punch a wooden dummy. They're not human beings, they're just targets that you can apply violence at. Except unlike watermelons or dummies, you cannot acquire advanced combat skills by playing video games, even in VR, as I explored in my last video. And you also discovered that human beings 
are violent in nature. Everyone is prone to aggression in some ways. Human beings can't just sit their asses all day. They need something that can entertain them, something active, something that can activate their adrenaline. Playing video games, do sports, jogging, workouts, etc. The word hobby exists for a reason. You might find one person's hobby disturbing, but as long as it's not breaking any crimes, I don't see any problems. Again, I don't think gaming causes violence, but it would be impossible for frequent immersion in violent scenarios, fictional or not, to not have some kind of effect on us. I agree. If you immerse yourselves to the violence in a fictional setting, you will get desensitized by violence in a fictional setting. If you immerse yourself to the violence in a real-world setting, you will get desensitized by violence in a real-world setting. To illustrate my point, I will ironically use a piece of fiction. Revy from Black Lagoon is a character who is so desensitized with violence, she is willing to resort to violence to solve any problem, an action that her partner Rock criticized. I am very sure that she has played way too many video games to come into that personality. However, these aren't just the people who have the video games do not cause violence but they have at least some effect argument. Just recently, I also found this familiar argument surfacing from the journalists themselves. Here's an article that says, well, just because these games don't cause violence in real life doesn't mean that they're not problematic in other ways. Journalists are going to spin this whole problematic angle in a very sophisticated explanation, but it's not really sophisticated. They just find ultra-violent content uncomfortable. That's it. Another take is from an article that suggests since video games metabolize a certain aggression, it's worth investigating the ideological effect or at least the implication of video games that promote and glamorize armed conflict. It links it to an article talking about Spec Ops The Line. Spec Ops The Line is a great game that absolutely criticizes the idea of modern shooters and the idea of player characters' power fantasy. But what Spec Ops The Line did is to deconstruct that premise. The game illustrates the point that if we're given that power and we use it irresponsibly, we're gonna end up creating monsters of our own. But just because a fictional media deconstructs a certain premise doesn't mean that we cannot enjoy its straight face, nor does it mean that it's wrong for us to enjoy them. Scream deconstructs slasher films, does that mean that we can't enjoy slasher films? Cabin in the Woods deconstructs horror movies in general, does that mean that we can't enjoy horror movies? The Dark Knight deconstructs the superhero genre, does that mean that we can't enjoy the Avengers? Another take is from The Week, which is straight up said, why can't we all admit that violent video games are sick? Well, we do, to some extent, they are sick in so many ways. Your point? The writer puts the premise that every single one of the pasty psychos who have shot their classmates and teachers in the last two decades has played such games. I hate to use this stupid analogy many times throughout this trilogy, but I have to use it just to illustrate how pointless this conversation is. They also breathe oxygen, and so many people do. But as you can see, there's a large number of people who breathe oxygen and play violent video games who turn out to be pretty normal. While they might be something that they have in common, I would be more focused on their mental illnesses than the game that they play, or even the guns that they use. A rather bizarre connection that this writer makes is misogynistic attitudes in films will make you a sexual harasser, and to prove this, he uses the hashtag MeToo movement. Writer, you do realize that Harvey Weinstein hasn't appeared frequently in movies, and yet he is the biggest harasser. You do realize that the reason why he does all of that is because of abuse of power, and not because, oh wow, this film tells me that it's okay to kill hookers. And this isn't even a good argument because Hollywood elites aren't the only ones enjoying Hollywood films. So many people around the world are enjoying Hollywood films. Are you saying that they're going to turn out like Harvey Weinstein? Also, by your insane logic, Hideo Kojima should turn out to be a school shooter too, right? The writer then asks, if someone created a video game in which it's possible to grope or even rape women, would we still consider it a harmless diversion unlikely to disfigure the imaginations of players? Well, the Japanese has made tons and tons and tons and tons of them. And once again, look at the rapes per capita. Just because you personally find the content disturbing doesn't mean that it's going to have an impact in the real world. And that's essentially the article's main point. The content is disturbing. The content is not innocuous. Whether or not the content is innocuous is a completely irrelevant discussion if we just point out to the decrease of violent crime rate and new violence compared to the rise of video game sales. A very interesting thing that I found out this article is if you search the word fiction, it doesn't appear at all. And I think that's one big lesson that you need to learn, writer. You need to learn what the word fiction means and understand that shooters are just glorified shooting targets that are not real in any way, shape, or form. Here's an article from the Daily Wire. Stop pretending violent video games are harmless just because you like playing them. 
Well, Ryder, stop pretending video games are harmful just because you don't like them. Please show me the harm that video games can cause to people. Then show me the effects of those harm in the real world. The writer points out correctly that we can throw studies that prove or disprove our points, but I don't have to throw studies. You just need to look at the rising sales of video games compared to youth violence and violent crime. By your logic, there should be some form of effect, but there clearly isn't. The writer then decided to shove his values that kids should read books, play outside, have conversations with their parents, and develop interests, hobbies, and skills that don't involve staring into glowing boxes. Oh, go screw yourself, writer. You're not anyone's parents except your own children. All of the time spent playing video games will isolate children. So what? That's their problem. I don't want parents to remove video games from their library. I want parents to let them grow into hikikomoris because the best way to teach children about the harshness of reality is if we let them experience it themselves. The writer didn't talk about the Sandy Hook shooter making 83,000 online kills in video games before he killed 20 children. Okay. How are those two things relevant to each other? I made 100,000 kills in Dynasty Warriors and the amount of Chinese businessmen that I killed is precisely zero. He then asked the question, are you going to tell me that you are positive his hours upon hours upon hours spent stewing in virtual violence had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with his murder spree? Yes. You can consult to my multiple friends about their 1 million total kills in CSGO. They haven't killed anybody. Again. Your point? Oh, but how are you supposed to prove that this violence in video games have nothing to do with violence in real life? With a bunch of anecdotes that easily trump yours because you only have one and I have 10. Others probably have hundreds. You want to know about what's going on in the dark minds of the Sandy Hook shooter? Maybe try researching his past about the mental illnesses and social disorders that he suffered. Even Wikipedia got the basics for you. And then the writer decided to answer the we're just killing pixels argument by saying, we know it's just pretend. We know that you're not going to be a serial killer, but you still enjoy pretending to kill people. It's still not good. It's still unhealthy. It is still disturbing. It's just like those who enjoy horror and torture porn movies. So here are my opinions and what makes a healthy, well-adjusted, morally aware person. In other words, I personally find it disturbing and offensive that people enjoy violent content because it disagrees with my view of what a moral human being should be. The article consists of nothing but the writer saying, this is disturbing, that's disturbing, that's horrible, that's monstrous, that's ugly, without even giving any sorts of reason and why should people care. It looks unhealthy and disturbing to the writer's eyes, that's all there is to it. It's entirely an appeal to emotion. The writer then went on to talk about his experience on seeing the movie Hostel and the writer finds it disturbing. Disturbing, but his friend loved it. After knowing this fact, the writer said, well, he shouldn't love it. There's nothing to love about that film. Writer, I personally don't enjoy films like Hostel, Saul, or bizarre torture flicks like a Serbian film, but I don't go into the people who enjoyed them and shove my opinions to them. I especially don't tell them what they can and cannot love. You have to be an utterly miserable person to even think like that. Oh no, somebody enjoyed something that I personally don't. I mean, you admitted that your own friend doesn't grow up to be a serial killer, so I still don't understand your problem other than you personally find the content morally reprehensible. Please explain to me why should I care? The writer then talks about desensitization, which as I have established previously, just because you are desensitized with violent entertainment media doesn't mean that you are desensitized with violence in real life, especially when the violence in the media are exaggerated into the most over-the-top fashion. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, what was that? Sorry, but you got this dying thing all wrong. Only place you'll see people go down like that is in movies. He then said that the most offensive thing that you can do in modern society is to criticize a person's entertainment choices. You know what else is a very offensive thing that you can do in a modern society? Shout the n-word to a black person. The writer thinks that maybe, more than anything, you absolutely should do that most offensive thing. Well, writer, just because shouting the n-word to a black person is the most offensive thing that you can do in modern society doesn't mean that you should do it, nor does it mean that it's the right thing to do. What a fallacious argument to end this article. It seems to me that there are lots of people in this video games are violent camp with different arguments, points of views, and most importantly motivations and going to their agendas. And none of them are in there just so that people can be happy and play their video games peacefully, without any sorts of censorship, government interference, dumbass journalists being dumbass journalists, and of course microtransactions. I've said this for more than two years now, and I'm going to say it until I die. I just want to play video-